So today we're going to talk about uh, real fundamentals, rudimentary, uh, basic techniques of on-farm plant breeding. Uh, this is essentially all based on techniques that uh, we have extrapolated now, and it's been so nice to have not only Jared's brain, primarily Jared's brain is my main go-to guy but for bouncing ideas, but a whole number of other plant breeders that we have really, uh, the old saying, the old cliche, we stand on the shoulder of giants, because many other people uh, have forged this trail starting over 100 years ago in the beginnings of plant breeding. And all that we've tried to do in the past six or eight years is to make this truly farmer friendly. So hopefully you'll get a taste, taste of that with this presentation. Whoops, I lost contact. It didn't even touch any buttons. And the nice thing about this presentation too, I made the original presentation, Jared changed it some, he sent it back to me, I changed it some, sent it back to him, he changed it. So this is really a cooperative presentation here with Jared, it's full credit. Okay, uh, I'm going to start by saying a few words about Nash Huber, one of our local growers, luckily he's not in the room, easier. Um, Nash is one of our prime candidates for on-farm breeding. Uh, and I can tell that best by the story. This story really exemplifies why he is one of the prime, prime suspects in this whole on-farm breeding thing. Nash uh, runs about 400 acres of vegetables on rotation, also grow, growing more and more grains. I'm sure some of the bread we'll be eating is from his grain grown over in Squim, Washington, which is about 30 miles from here as the crow flies on the Olympic Peninsula. Beautiful little Squim Dungeness uh, River Valley. Anyway, uh, one of Nash's prime crops is carrots, and in fact, winter carrots. Uh, anyone interested in the winter carrot breeding, uh, we are doing an intensive project on that, and we'll cover that in the Novik slot this afternoon specifically. But I like to use this as an example because Nash was a farmer with the need. The, after a number of years of trying to identify good varieties for his winter production that were in fact the classic uh, organic fresh market Nance type carrot. Uh, he had found one that he really liked. And all of a sudden the seed company pulled the plug. And it was an older open pollinated Nance variety. And the seed company stopped producing the seed, stopped carrying and producing the seed. So Nash was in a lurch. He had gone through literally dozens of carrot varieties trying to find this one. And um, he said, well, I guess I've got to grow my own seed. And having grown up on a f uh, farm in Illinois, southern Illinois, uh, where they still, as a kid in the 50s, grew a lot of their own seed, he said, well, that can't be that hard. You know, what do we have to do here? It's a biennial. That's a little odd. But uh, he essentially started to do it. And from that, he started to select and adapt that variety. And here he is in seed production for that Nance. He's since then found a couple other varieties that work for his system, but he's still maintaining. He's now been his, and he's been the sole uh, source of this seed for his operation for the past 10 years. And he grows, uh, depending on the year, between uh, 40 and 60 acres of carrots. So it's it ain't just growing a little patch in the backyard. Um, so that's, that's a classic story we hear. And if I don't get to say at any other point, that's the kind of motivation that we really like in the farmers that we work with on, on these uh, participatory on-farm breeding projects that we do. So let's jump right in. So the first question that farmers, as they get better and better at what they do, they have to ask themselves as they screen through varieties of whatever the specific crop they want to grow, you know, is the, are the varieties that they're using truly adapted to their climate, soils, production systems? Organic production systems are often uh, significantly different than conventional systems for a raft of reasons. We'll touch on a couple in a few minutes on one of the slides. 
Um, and then, of course, many, many of us who are in the organic uh, uh, produce uh, s deal, production systems, uh, have very specific markets that are, that are unique, like the Nance carrot. When I first uh, was breeding carrots at the University of Wisconsin when I was a grad student with Phil Simon, who will be here later today, um, Industry, basically, Phil told me that industry had completely, at least in North America, given up on the Nance carrot. It wasn't, it wasn't important. I said, oh my God, well, all the organic guys that I know that grow carrots, that's what they're growing. But that was still less than 1%, far less than 1% of the overall production. The point here is, you don't always get what you want. There aren't always breeders out there really thinking about you and these particular parts of your system. Um, so if you do have a variety that you like, there are some basic questions that you often have to ask. Is that open pollinated variety, by the way, OP always means open pollinated. I'm, I'm assuming everybody knows the difference between OP and F1 in the room. Um, anyway, if it's a non-hybrid variety, is it well maintained? We often have problems with, uh, in cross-pollinated species, they, there's a lot of uh, ongoing variation that comes up and that is segregating through the population. They're never 100% uh, fixed to type. So really it's the mark of the, of the seeds person who maintains that variety, who produces the seed and maintains it to keep it well maintained. And we teach specific classes with whole sessions on this. But to cut to the quick, not all of our good old OPs are good old OPs anymore because they haven't been well maintained. Is it high quality seed? Is the seed you're buying, you may say, well, I can still get Scarlet Nance seed, but it is, is it of, if you're a commercial farmer, is it of commercial quality of seed that you can produce it and get a 95% stand? on the seed that's, uh, that's drilled into the soil. Um, if you're using hybrids, as many of our growers do, <coughs> is it a mainstay variety? What does that mean? Well, is it a variety that's really used enough in significant enough quantities that it stays as a mainstay for many years to come? Because once a, once a seed company drops below a certain amount of sales or has problems producing that seed, they will drop uh, some of their hybrid varieties quick as a hot potato and uh, all of a sudden you're in the lurch and many of you who are commercial farmers certainly have had this, I'm sure you've had this problem. And also our F1s maintained. We just heard another story just two days ago at our Novik meeting uh, about a squash that from England that is um, miserably segregating this year, all sorts of different odd shapes, and I won't say the name of the squash, I won't beat up on it in public, but it was a hybrid that a lot of organic farmers were starting to uh, really like and was good for northern uh, butternut growers. And it's not well maintained. So, and even hybrid seed, of course, nothing magic about hybrids, it can be poor quality seed. So this is often, all of these things are reasons above and beyond needing a specific variety that's not available, you may have a variety that's available but doesn't uh, meet all of these criteria and fall down. And then there's the real conundrum which is what about certified organic? In the letter of the law we're supposed to all use certified organic seed. So this has driven, all of these factors have driven people to producing their own seeds. So let's talk about the fundamentals of on-farm on plant breeding. Uh, there are typical tra traits that we evaluate and that we think about is the, is the variety up to snuff. I'll go through these quickly and I'll give a couple of quick examples, but things like plant height, well, what is, does that really matter? It certainly may not matter in squash, but I'm a beet breeder and plant height, the tall tops, really matters for my fresh market growers that want my tall top beets because there are not many available. Uh, what about the plant stature? Is it, uh, does it have a nice upright stature or is it prostrate to the ground? That can make a big difference in your production system. Leaf type, 
something like arugula, so there's a wide range of leaf types. It makes a big deal, a big uh, difference in someone's uh, particular market. Days to maturity, of course, harvestable yield, color, we know all of these. These are uh, common to all farmers everywhere with their crops. Uh, how about flavor texture? How about storage life? There are differences if we get into varieties. And all of those traits that I just mentioned are common to all, uh, pretty much all farmers. It's not just for organic farmers. But now let's talk about some of the traits to consider for organic growers. Uh, seedling vigor really makes a difference in uh, avoiding things like damping off. Seedling vigor makes a big difference in getting ahead of the weeds in our systems that don't use herbicides. Um, of course, as I always say, Michaela teases me, all God's children want uh, pest resistance and disease resistance. It's not unique just to organic growers, but often organic growers have less options uh, as far as spraying for those things. But we do have less options, period. Uh, weed competitiveness is something I'll talk a bit more about again if you come to the Novik uh, presentation this af afternoon. Novik is Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative and we'll have a session with all of the breeders from around the country and specifically I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, what about nutri nutri nutrient scavenging? This has to do with uh, how, how good of a root mass you put down and even physiologically how adept those roots are at scavenging nutrients. That can make a big difference in a heat-loving crop in cool soils. Lori Hoagland, we're fortunate to have Dr. Lori Hoagland from Purdue here is going to talk a bit about that. And she's uh, a guiding light in this, trying to tease this out for organic growers. Um, specialty markets, of course, we have unique specialty markets. And then what about drought tolerance in our climate, climate chaos that we're now entering or have been in for a few years? We're getting droughty, uh, droughty seasons that we never saw before. We're getting heat or cold or, and specifically with the uh, zucchini, I'll talk about wind, wind tolerance. But all of those are regular conventional uh, commercial varieties, may not deliver all of these things that, that if we had them, would really make a difference in our lives. Okay, how about the fundamentals of this on-farm breeding? I've broken it down into basically three categories. The methodology. If you're going to do this on-farm, it's got to be easy. You've got to be able to fit it into your system. Uh, it has to be easy for the farmer to execute with minimum or no. Many of the crops I work with specifically we don't do any hand pollinations. As soon as you mention plant breeding, I know I thought of, long before I became a plant breeder, I thought of uh, people in white coats in a greenhouse with uh, glasses on and, and or, or glasses with little extensions emasculating flowers and making crosses. I haven't made a hand pollination in, well, I guess I did a few squash four or five years ago. I haven't made a hand pollination in years. I let the insects do it, or I also work with cross-pollinated species. Makes it easier. Um, minimum note-taking. Farmers, uh, in my experience, uh, working with them for many years now, not great note-takers. And the uh, truth of the matter is, I'm not either. I take my necessary minimum notes. I want to cut to the quick. What's good and what's not? And I'm not going to keep comprehensive pedigrees of hundreds or thousands of things. I don't have the staff to do it, and farmers certainly don't have the staff to do it. Uh, so, and minimum collecting of pedigreed seed lots. This is a reference to the fact that in many breeding programs, there are literally thousands of seed lots to keep track of. We're not going to get farmers to do that. Now, we have to, yet, deliver a reasonable amount of gain for selection per cycle. And this will come up, this basically means uh, every time we select, we've got to really make progress. And this will be the contrast between mass selection and progeny selection that I'll show you in a minute. We'll, we'll explain that a bit better. Uh, and then, uh, true to my philosophy, is I believe we have to always make sure we're retaining as much genetic 
variability or variation as possible for further selection on farm, further selection for adaptation on different farms, and for the ability of growers to keep adapting it, keep changing it to changing climate, changing needs, changing uh, agronomic techniques that they're using on farm, production techniques. So I bend over backwards and you'll see this where we try to keep it variable but yet uh, have enough, have adequate uniformity for the marketplace. And hopefully at the end maybe with questions we can ask a little bit or discuss a little bit about uh, uniformity and, and whether we need to have the hybrid uniformity that's been, I think, shoved down our throats for many years. Okay, uh, breeding in a nutshell. Here's the main topics I'll go through for the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, choose the right crop. Learn the reproductive uh, biology of that crop. You've got to know some basic biology about that crop if you're going to breed it. You know what's happening, what's crossing with what, and when it's happening. Uh, you have to establish breeding goals. It's very good, important thing to do. You have to conduct trials, in my estimation. Uh, you have to identify useful variation, and that's why that's part and parcel to this trial part. So once you pick some breeding objectives, then you have to say, where am I going to get the, the best version of those traits that will fulfill these breeding goals? Um, and then, and I'll talk about this in a minute further, but I put it in here to just to get you thinking about it, because it's a very important point to me. Make crosses if necessary. There's lots of good genetic uh, pools. There are lots of good varieties out there that have plenty of genetic variability that some of my most successful breeding projects have just been where I've taken a, a open pollinated variety that already existed that had lots of variability and started to breed within that population and pull something out. This is a classic method breeders have farmer breeders have used since time in memoriam. Uh, so you don't always need to cross is the point. And I'll, I'll beat that drum a little bit more in a minute. Um, also sometimes one of the squash project I was involved in for a number of years, the uh, craw, not the zucchini project I'm going to talk about here, a little bit different, but uh, a winter squash project, it was an errant cross between two winter squashes and it was turned out to be the best cross anybody ever could have made. It was some seed I got through the Seed Savers Exchange from uh, a woman in South Dakota. It was lovely. So you have to fix important traits, so let's get to it. So choosing the right crop. If you're going to bother to breed something, it has to be meaningful to you. It has to be important, I truly believe. It has to be very important on your farm so you have incentive. And you really have to uh, I don't know how else to say this, but you got to love it. You really have to enjoy working with that crop, eating that crop, going out and looking at it first thing in the morning, even before you do anything else. It's just, yeah, I just want to go out and look at that crop before I get going on my day. Those are the crops that we have found farmers are most successful breeding, the ones they really are excited about. No wonder. Uh, can you produce seed in your climate? We live in a very nice place to produce cabbage seed. Here's a cabbage field on uh, Whidbey Island, probably about 12 miles from here as the crow flies. It's, it, it, we're living in a world-class climate for cabbage seed. Uh, and does it fit your system? The breeding has to, as far as the cyclical nature, the, uh, the seasonal nature of the crop, when you harvest seed, if all of a sudden the seed or the evaluation comes due right when you're at your busiest with some cash crop that you have to get in and deal with, then that might not be the best crop for you because you might not be able to take the time that's necessary to do the evaluation or gathering of the seed or whatever. And then there's the question of crossers and selfers, which I'll talk about right here. So now in re this is reproductive biology. This is a wonderful little diagram that Jared made out of uh, some notes that I had, uh, though this is common. I mean, it's any good plant breeder knows this through and through. 
so when you're cho choosing between self-pollinated species and cross-pollinated species, and that's the first thing you have to figure out about your crop. Is it a self or is it a crosser? Selfers are often easier because you need less isolation. Uh, they don't cross when you don't want them to, essentially, at least if you give them a modicum of, of separation between bean crops, for instance, or wheat crops, wheat plots, uh, crossers need more. So that may impact your, your on-farm breeding. Crossing of selfers yet, though, is harder. So physically doing a cross or getting a cross-pollination. Uh, we have a lettuce uh, breeding guide that will be coming out. We'll talk about the methodology that Frank Morton uses, where he gets crosses to happen without doing hand uh, pollinations in lettuce. But uh, you have to know your crop. You have to know the biology to do that in the selfer. Whereas in a crosser, it's easy, as we'll show you, to make a strain cross. You put two varieties next to each other, and you let the insects or the wind do it. Self-pollinating uh, is easier, so there are times in plant breeding when you have to self-pollinate. Uh, selfing in self-pollinated species happens naturally. Crossers, you may have to go in. That may have to be your manual manipulation of flowers, the only manipulation you do. Uh, inbreeding depression in selfers is less likely, I like to say. Uh, it, crossers don't all, not all varieties of crossers get, uh, not all species and or varieties within species get inbreeding depression, but you run a much higher risk. So you have to do some uh, fancy dance steps to make sure you have enough variability going into any project so you don't just end up with uh, inbred runty thing, which there have been many cross-pollinated vegetable crops that have been even released in the marketplace that I consider runty and inbred. <clears throat> okay, quality traits. These are, these are gimmies, but I'll mention them quickly. Qu quality traits, well, all those specific traits, flavor, color, texture, leaf curl, those are easy. Adaptation. I truly believe adaptation climatically is one of the most important things that we can be breeding for and that we have to always be conscious for, uh, for obvious reasons. Vigor, uh, seedling vigor. What about other kinds of vigor? In Nash's kale that we're going to use as an example here, um, uh, his regrowth in spring, it's an overwintering crop, the regrowth in February and March is his most important vigor issue. And he's been selecting for vigor at that stage in the life. So it's not just seedling vigor. Uh, of course, resistance, disease, heat, cold, drought, etc. OK, so trials. You have to start with trials, I believe. You evaluate potential varieties. Always ask yourself, and every good old plant breeder will always say when you say, oh, I've got this great idea for a breeding project. Man, I'd just love to breed a zucchini that's got this, this, and this. Anyone really wise in this business says, well, are you sure that doesn't already exist? If there's a variety out there that already fits that bill. Don't go reinventing the wheel. Put your energy to good use. Uh, that's one of the reasons you do trials, and that's one of the reasons if you really love a crop, you'll take more time to really know the extent of the germplasm that is available, uh, which I mentioned, know your germplasm down here. And that's part of that. Is there a variety that already works? Know your germplasm, and you can usually answer that. Germplasm, by the way, just the, the great scope of all of the, the, the variety range, let's call it, within a particular crop species. Uh, is there a variety that almost works? Sometimes there are varieties that almost work that are hidden within other varieties. It's like, well, I'm trying to think of a quick and dirty example here. Well, this squash that I found from South Dakota from, through Seed Savers, you know, it's like, wow, it almost worked for what I wanted. It was just a little, little bit too, too many Hubbard shapes coming out in the mix, but it had uh, seedling vigor, it matured very early, it had a bunch of the things I wanted. So all I had to do is go in that variety and select, narrow out, pull out a variety out of a germplasm pool that I already had. I won't make that point again. 
But oftentimes you need to take, you have to identify a two, sometimes three, you can make multiple cross, crosses, you have to identify two or more varieties that have the combination of traits that really is what you feel you need for your situation. So that, again, know your germplasm. Now, when we do a longer version of this, we talk a lot about the fundamentals of conducting trials. Very important. Don't just go out and do an observation plot, do a real trial. And for that, we have an incredible resource listed right here on farm variety trials. If you go to the OSA website to publications, you can get this as a free download. Michaela put this together with some help from Jim Myers a number of years ago. It's the best uh, really simple direct how you do on-farm trials document I've ever seen. Very important. OSA freebie. Okay, now, so the first thing I'm going to talk about, if you have to make a cross, whether you're going to do mass selection or progeny selection, first thing you do, I use an old trick from the alfalfa breeders, called they call a strain cross. You don't make a single plant times single plant cross. Why? Well, especially in cross-pollinated species, I want to retain, if I've got a green chard that's got the curl I want, this is lacinato on the left, and I've got a red chard like red board that's got the color that I want, and I want that color in the green one. Um, no one lacinato plant in a cross-pollinated species has got all of the good genes that make lacinato lacinato. So I don't want a one-to-one -one cross in that situation, especially for the kind of breeding we're doing where we're trying to retain a lot of genetic variation. So we'll often start with 50 to 100 plants per variety, plant them next to each other. Now this just happens, this was our best photo. This is a commercial field of kale. There was no crossing going on here, but it shows it nicely. Anyway, I'd start with at least 50 plants if you can, and as they grow up, Select, that gives you latitude to select them heavily during that first season so you get the best parents, parent plants out of 50. And what the alfalfa breeders do, and alfalfas, um, I used to work with an alfalfa breeder and we were breeding spinach together and he always just said, hey, this is great breeding spinach. It's just, it's just like, it's alfalfa for people. And alfalfa is a cross-pollinated species, lots of genetic variation, plant-to-plant variation. They don't have to worry about getting it super uniform. So they always go into a cross with at least 15 or 20 plants from each variety that they want to cross when they're trying to come up with something new. So then you harvest the seed from each of the two varieties, and you grow them the next year as two separate batches. You've got crosses. And oftentimes, and we look at the OSA literature, we have some write-ups on this sort of thing, and we'll have more as Jared prepares a bunch of this plant breeding toolkit that he's working on so diligently. Um, there are tricks to the trade of, you know, if you plant out the green kale, we happen to know that red is dominant to green. So if you plant the seed from the green variety the next year, all the plants that are red from the seed that came from the greens, you know are crosses. So they're tricks of the trade. Basically, you can almost always tell intermediates between the two varieties. And there you've let the bees do the crossing or the wind, and all you have to do is pick the ones that are obvious crosses. Very important in all of my breeding, I then allow them to intermate for at least one or two seasons and mix up. If in preferably, in a couple of cases, we've had the fortune of having it be for four seasons. And I learned that from Bill Tracy is actually in the room. <laughs> okay, on-farm selection. Let's quickly go through mass selection. I have this sneaky feeling I'm going to run out of time here. Uh, mass selection is simple, most widespread. This is what all of our ancestors essentially used. Let's just put it that way and I'll describe it in a section. Second, progeny selection, fairly simple trick that can speed the breeding process but still can be, essentially, it's my best method for on-farm. It's a form of recurrent selection uh, using progeny. Uh, mass selection is essentially just going out in a population and selecting individuals that look the best. If you can select the individuals before 
they intermate before they cross, which you can do in onions, for instance, you can do in carrots, based on the phenotype or how they look is, as the vegetable that you're harvesting, then you have, uh, then you haven't allowed any of the runty looking plants to cross into the good population that you're trying to select, and you will make better gain from selection. So always select before pollination if possible. Now, in something like sweet corn, in something like zucchini, that's not easy. So if you have to do it after uh, pollination, well, not as good, but better. But there are always some uh, selection you can do before for certain traits of any crop, even though you don't get to look at the zucchini fruit or the ear of corn. And we'll talk about some of those traits in the crops that we're going to look at. When you do mass selection and you just have a square patch of the variety out in the field, always cut that patch into quadrants and try to select an even number of plants from each quadrant. This is a really important tip. This is a nice little diagram from Jared. I appreciate it very much. Each star is a plant there. So in those first couple of generations, let's just say you're taking five or ten of the best plants from each quadrant. You've got a block of, uh, I don't know, carrots half the size of this stage. You cut it into four and you dig up all the carrots and you say, I'm going to take at least ten carrots from each of the quadrants. Why? Because once you might say, well, there are no good carrots over in this side of the patch. They're all over on that side. I'm only going to pick the ones from the far side of the patch. Well, why is that? It's because the soil is better, the environment is better on the one side. So always force yourself to take the best ones even from the poor soil. Does everybody get this? That way you'll be getting the best representatives. If you only get the best ones from the best corner of the trial, you're picking largely based on environmental influence into those plants. Okay, now we're going to get to the nitty-gritty of progeny selection, and then we'll give you a couple examples, and I'm going to trot through this introductory, because we'll go through this again. So select a minimum of 50 plants from the population at first. So this is the population. Remember, you made the strain cross. You let it intermate a couple of years. We'll tell you how Nash did this in his kale in a minute. Then you go out in the plot and you find, I always like to find the 50 best plants in the plot. So if it's a commercial farmer that's got, like Nash often has, an acre or two of a particular kale variety, you know, you go out and evenly within four quadrants, you pick the 50 best plants. And you do this, all the best farmers always, once they get this, they say, well, I can't go out and pick them on any one day. I've got to watch those plants over weeks and weeks of harvest in the case of kale. I've got to look at it in the fall. I've got to look at it in the spring. So you can start to mark plants that you like, and then you might change your mind in spring when it's half dead from powdery mildew. So you save seed from those 50 plants into individual little brown bags that you get from the supermarket lunch bags. You number them 1 through 50. <clears throat> the next year, you plant 50 individual rows, preferably two replications of that. If you don't know what reps are, look at our on-farm trial manual and explain the whole rep thing without me doing it now. And you plant out those 50 rows twice. Short, relatively short. We'll show you what they look like in a second, how long they are when we show you a kale picture. So then, the next year, you go out, you've got those 50 rows. I know there's only three on this image, but let's say that's 50 in one of the reps. And you select, usually I find about 15 or 20 percent of the rows are going to be good. You are going to be amazed that first year at how many of the rows out there look pretty shoddy. And that seed came from a good plant. And you're going, holy crow, what's going on here? Well, it's the power of progeny testing. So select 15 to 20% of the families based 
based on the family, on how good the whole row looks. You're going to find really good plants in each individual row, but they're not going to be, if the rest of the, if 80% of the row looks lousy and there's one or two good plants, uh-uh, don't be tempted. Those plants could just be growing on a very fertile spot. They, that could have been the spot where you dumped fertilizer last year inadvertently, something like that. So the rows have got to look good overall. So then you eliminate the poor families. When I show you zucchini, we're going to talk about Bill just going out and rototilling up the rows he didn't like. In the case of kale, and you know, if you're a commercial farmer, if it's kale and it's springtime, well, you go out and you harvest the hell out of all the poor rows and sell it, and then you eliminate them. Just get rid of them because you don't want them flowering. You do not want the poor rows, even the best plants in the poor rows, contributing to that next step of the population. So then, did I press that twice or was that? Um, no, I guess we get them all. So then you eliminate 30, 30 to 40 percent. It's only a good row if over 50 percent of the plants look really good in that progeny row. Now those rows, remember, those rows came from one bag of seed from one mother plant the year before. So it, over 50 percent of the plants have to look good for it to be a good row, christened a good row, and then you eliminate 30 in the good rows, there's still some bad plants, so circle, the circled row here, you get rid of the poorest looking plants in the progeny row that you liked. Does everybody get that? Those are the plants that you're going to allow to intermate. Now this was 50 rows, so let's say there were eight rows out there, about 15 percent. There were about eight rows out there that you really liked. So you went through the eight, you left only eight good rows, you eliminated the lousy plants, and you let them all intermate. Okay, then you you bulk the seed from those eight rows that were good the year before. So you bulk the seed, that circled row, what I always do is I then go in and harvest seed from all of those plants together in that row and now I've got a bigger, now I need a big grocery sack for seed for that. Also, I always double my brown paper bags. Um, okay, so then you plant the selected families, evaluate. Sometimes that one cycle of selection, if the material you started with was pretty darn good and wasn't segregating a lot, is ready to go, especially if you're cl cleaning up an old OP. This is a great way to clean up an old OP. So if you have something that's almost where you want it, this, sometimes you don't have to repeat this. Repeat if necessary, okay? Uh, so, progeny selection, you will make much faster gain from selection. You will get results much quicker. Uh, it is more difficult. You've got to keep some pedigree information. You have to plant those individual rows. It takes room. But families give you the insight into essentially the hidden genetics. Um, so mass selection is simple, 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 no family information, no record keeping, but it's slow as molasses in January, as my grandmother would say. And uh, it is, uh, it's a, it, it, is it effective? Yes, it is. Almost all of the crop plants that we have today that came down through the ancestors came from mass selection. But we're going to talk about how fast progeny selection can be. So Nash had, a, uh, Nash had a vision of wanting a red kale. And I believe this was before red boar even came out. Um, and essentially what he's bred, this is kind of a summary of all of the good stuff that he needed, whether he realized all of this at the beginning. But he, he got downy mildew resistance, a decent level of downy mildew resistance, not complete upright stature, overwintering ability, vigorous regrowth I've mentioned, and a delicious red kale that on your way out of town you can stop at a bunch of different places and buy some. Um, red boar is the standard in the industry. Red boar, how many people have eaten red boar kale? Any Bayhoe sales reps here? 
no good. It's terrible. It tastes like cardboard. It, not, it chews like cardboard and it tastes like cardboard. I would say that even if a Bayo sales rep was here. Anyway, it's pretty though, isn't it? I bet some of you grow it just because it's so darn pretty. Um, it's awful. It's not that downy mildew resistant. It's got some. It's not the most susceptible. And its regrowth isn't that great. But as you can see, Nash even grows quite a bit of it. <laughs> There's money there. Okay, so, but you know, it's a real crime to sell people red boar kale because a lot of people, that might be the very first time they ever eat kale. And then they'll think, oh, this is as yucky as I thought it was going to be. Okay, so Nash found two plants in a, in, this is years ago now, 15 years ago, he found two plants of red kale in a Vates dwarf scotch kale field. Uh, he said the biggest problem with Vates is it's too squatty. So he crossed it with, uh, this was the brilliant thing. So there, this was just a gift from heaven above. He had a, a green, the old Vates variety. He had an acre of it, and there were two plants out in this acre of it. Was it a mutation? Was it a cross with something? We'll never know. But Nash, being the great opportunist, went out with his shovel one day and dug them up and moved them to his house, put them in his garden, and then he dug up a couple of his favorite Brussels sprouts plants. This was the real genius. I wouldn't have even thought of this. He said, I need these Vates things to be taller. They're not tall as a good commercial kale should be that holds the leaves up off the ground like this thing does. So he crossed it with Brussels sprouts. And then over, he saved the seed, he bulked all of the seed, and he just started to plant it. At first in a small patch and then in a bigger patch. And he selected very heavily for kale-like plants, good leaf curl that the Vates had, and the reddest plants he could find. But the problem was, and let's see if I'm jumping ahead of myself, the problem was by the time that uh, he came to OSA and said, God, you guys want to help me with this project, we had, there were still 10 to 15 percent of the plants that were not good enough. There were certainly greens. This is the kale as it looked a number of years ago, into about 2006. But for 10 years he'd been mixing up the genetics on this and it was, he had some really outstanding plants. So basically in one of those big fields we had him go and we're not going to go through the whole, um, uh, well, yeah, okay, we'll go through this quickly. Um, so in the, um, I'm going to cut to the quick here. In uh, 2008, he selected the best 50 plants for leaf curl, all of those good things. He actually even tasted for texture, whether you, could, whether you can really tell good flavor in kale raw, you, you can to some degree. Um, stature, all of that good stuff, you know the drill. And he allowed 50 plants, he actually, it was a two acre field I believe of his, what he was just calling Nash's Red, he actually dug up the 50 plants and took them to another field. Let them intermate, did everything I just told you, saved the seed into separate bags. He planted out then 50 rows and he, uh, and this is where actually Jared helped him on this project. And they went through and they evaluated rows for, uh, number one thing they wanted to get rid of was the recurring green plants, recessive trait. They were in the population. They were going to come out forever and ever. You can't get rid of something like a recessive trait, like a green plant, uh, with mass selection, even if you do it for 300 generations. But once you prod if you plant at least 50 plants in each progeny row and evaluate it, if there are no greens, the chances are you're not hiding any greens at that point. So the rows had to be all red. They had to have good leaf curl. They had to have nice stature. That was key to this for commercial uh, harvest all along. And we even got rid of some rows with early bolters. Resulted in 13 all red rows. This is essentially where this research has stopped. And what has Nash been growing ever since? His good old population, which he's made some nice mass selections on. But this year we're finally going to get back to this 
puppy. And we're just, now we're down to 13 good rows. So another cycle of selection, and we should truly have a finished variety. Okay, here's my other example, and I think I have just enough time. We were saying 50 minutes, can we go to the top of the hour? Okay, and there'll still be plenty of time for questions. And we're going to have some questions coming in from our uh, distance learners, right? Okay, Bill Reynolds, Eel River, right down near where uh, uh, Jared lives, down in Arcata, California, uh, actually Shively. So Bill and I started this project a number of years ago. Bill Reynolds owned the organic zucchini market for San Francisco back in the 90s, producing uh, Raven Hybrid, which is shown right here. Beautiful, uh, cylindrical. The lutein is what gives it that beautiful dark, almost black color, hence the name Raven. Um, anyway, these are the traits that Bill has ended up with. Some of these traits were true, certainly, in Raven. It had some degree of spinelessness. It wasn't great. It had a nice bush habit, open canopy, uh, and it was productive. But as we'll see, what came up it was even more productive. So Bill does essentially what I sometimes uh, inexactly call dryland zucchini farming. Essentially, uh, in Northern California there, it stops raining about the second week of May and doesn't rain again until October. So Bill, Bill has no irrigation set up on his farm. He lives near the Eel River. He plants into a moist seed bed, uh, gets a stand, and the roots, the tap root on squash are at least three or four feet deep. They get down to groundwater, essentially. But he has to have a very, very vigorous plant to be able to do this. Also has to have an open, this open bush habit. Uh, crucial in zucchini, number one, it minimizes the scarring on your hands and wrists for the humans who are harvesting them, but it also minimizes, very importantly, the scarring on the fruit. When you have too thick of a plant, the old-fashioned zucchini plants, you, you tend to get fruit that either gets scarred in the wind, as the plant is rocking back and forth in the wind and rubs against those spines on the petioles, or you get often scars when the human cuts the fruit and pulls it out of the plant and rips it along some uh, spines. So that's showing you the relative spinelessness of raven way back when. So uh, long story short, Bill had problems procuring enough raven seed for his uh, several acre production for the San Francisco market. And Bill was, uh, Bill truly paid off his mortgage with uh, organic zucchinis to San Francisco. Um, so Bill could no longer get raven hybrid seed. That does happen. And when you can't get hybrid seed of a hybrid that you rely on, is there any recourse? No, there is not, because you can't save seed from a hybrid, right, and get the thing that you wanted. Uh, so anyway, Bill uh, bought some Black Beauty. It's an old OP from the University of Connecticut many years ago. Uh, good dark fruit. Uh, was very happy because it had an extensive rooting system, got down to the water, and had a long harvest season, but it had a very closed canopy. He had scratched up fruits, many off-type fruits. Only one out of four plants were, was really harvestable. So the very first year that Bill grew Black Beauty, he grew about half of it. He still had some raven seed. He planted it out next to his raven in a, in a field, in a big acre production field, half raven, half black beauty. He said, wow, well, about a quarter of the plants are good in the black beauty. I know I can save seed on an OP. I think I'm going to start saving my own seed because I don't ever want to get screwed again with the uh, seed reps telling me I can't buy raven zucchini. Uh, so uh, inadvertently, without even realizing it, he essentially crossed raven and black beauty. Um, uh, and then he took the seed, he harvested a lot of seed, pounds of the seed, and for the next four seasons, he basically drilled it with a Planet Junior thick, and he would select based on seedling vigor, uh, on plant, and if it would muster, I mean, he would literally, literally have a zucchini plant every two inches in the field apart, and he'd go out and do repeated selection 
for one of the most vigorous plants because the thing he knew is he had to have a plant that got down to the water or else he was screwed. Um, so he, as the plant got older, he left it at a higher density. He would select then for open plant type. And lo and behold, he was getting some nice open plant types because he didn't even realize it when I first talked to him, but it had crossed with the raven. And that actually brought in some genes for that open stature. So at the end of, uh, and then he selected very uh, adamantly for fruit type because that's how he had established such a good market in the San Francisco market. He sold into to many, many people bought Zooks that weren't even organic uh, buyers, uh, many restaurants, et cetera, because it was such a nice quality product. So that resulted in black eel, which you see after four generations. He had a pretty nice OP zucchini on the right, black eel. Um, and then on the left is raven, the standard. Uh, problem is, in his black eel, he'd still get vining zucchinis. You ever see a vining zucchini? He'd get yellow zucchinis. He'd get all sorts of interesting things. This just shows the fruit at maturity. There's the, actually the name of the namesake, Dark Star. Uh, but anyway, in season five, what we did here in my remaining five minutes, I'll go through this breeding strategy because it worked really nicely. In season five, he attempted selfs on 50 best plants. This was in 2003. He and his partner went out and tried to do uh, 50 selfs, and uh, it's not always easy getting any of you have pollinated squash, getting good takes on your, on your hand pollinations. So he got 26 successful selfs. And this is out of a big acre field. And he, uh, boy, he pained over finding what he thought were the best 50. So he saved seed from 26. Those were the successful ones, separate bags. Each bag is then, because it was self-pollinated, it's called the full sip family. And we'll have some literature describing all of that for those who want to take this one step further. Uh, the next year, he planted 26 rows. I tried to get him to do two reps. He didn't. But he planted 26 full sib rows uh, in progeny rows. And uh, the good news was I thought it was going to be a real struggle where Bill was going to I, I, and I drove down to California to do this with him once the zooks were ready. Uh, at the harvestable stage. I thought I was going to have to fight with him over, oh, he picked 15 of the 26 families. He was all nervous because only four of the families really looked good, maybe five. I said, Bill, that's perfect. So four of them looked good. Um, so what he did was he then went in, and I don't know how much I want to get into my slide where I have a diagram, but he went in and um, he basically took out 22 of the rows. And then what he did, because he was basing this on the evaluation of the zucchini fruit as well as the plants. The plants had to have the good stature, all those good traits, but they had to have the beautiful fruit. So what we did at that point is we went in and uh, we harvested all of the fruit that had already set on the four rows. Everybody get it? He did one last harvest of the whole patch, essentially all 26 rows, sold the zooks, and then he went out literally with the rototiller and rototilled up 22 rows. We had four rows in the field. I'm sure his neighbors thought, what the hell is Bill doing now? There are just four rows of random rows out in the big field of the zucchini. And we then went through adamantly taking off every any fruit that had already been pollinated. Get it? So we basically had our cake and were eating it too because there were no pollinations that occurred from the 22 poor rows. And because in Northern California they have a long enough season, we couldn't do this here. We were doing this in the second week of August. And there was still enough uh, season left for the fruit to, to set, the next set of fruit to set, get pollinated and fully mature seed, which is about 40, 45 days from anthesis or from pollination. Everybody got that. So we just had seed on four rows that were, had only been pollinated by other good rows. So we then harvested that seed as four, four big shopping bags of seeds. He kept four big piles of zooks from all of the best plants. We eliminated the poor plants in each of the best rows. Remember that little step? Um, 
anyway, uh, here's Bill doing hand pollination, showing it at a workshop. Anyway, to make a long story short, I will show you this for a second. So uh, year one is just showing you that he took random 26 plants out of a big field, self them, planted four rows. Those are in half rows down in year two, if you can read that. They actually were row 8, 21, 32, 41 from the year before. Those were the rows. Um, planted them. Oh, well, no, that was all of the 26. We liked those four rows in year two. So then we went in, and I've supposedly had a pointer here, but to heck with it. Wherever you see the X's, those were eliminated. We just saved seed from the four, and we went to the next year where we just had four rows. And then we replicated it. He planted a huge, it was almost, because we had so much seed, it was almost an acre and a half field of just these four varieties. So we could really look at the four, not varieties, four half sib at that point, they were half sib progeny rows because they had all sibnated between each other. So we technically use that term half sib. So the next year we had four rows replicated, big field, but it was all based on those seed from those four rows. We liked, I thought, well now three out of the four are going to look good and I'm going to have to struggle with Bill to get him down to just two of the four probably. He called me up and said, John, only one of them really looks good. I said, okay, and that's what we're going with, Bill, the one that looks good. I trust you. So we then, he then went in, made one last harvest, rototilled out everything except for row 41. And 41 was the number that came from two years before. He kept those numbers. It was easiest for him. So we just left the 41s out there. We went through and took out the worst plants out of 41. And from that, one cycle of selection, because he had broken up the linkage blocks essentially and mixed it up nicely in those four years, I think, we got a, a damn good zucchini. So now in summary, um, we started, he started testing this in Baja in the winter, grew it both in Northern Cal and Baja. Very resilient, very adaptive, could really take the weather in Baja. Winter in Baja is windy as hell. And these plants were sturdy. As Bill said, he always selected them to be real Christmas trees. And in fact, they were. And they didn't wave in the wind nearly as much as the regular hybrids that the grower was growing down there. They ended up yielding five to six weeks longer <coughs> than Raven or the other leading hybrids. They, um, there were male flowers right up till the end, which was an extra benefit we never selected for. How that happened, not sure. And the grower really loved that because in, in regular commercial zucchini production, oftentimes your plants will, in hybrids will keep putting out females but won't have males to pollinate them. And if you don't get a good pollination on a female, you don't get a good fruit set. Oftentimes when you have the little shrimpy uh, failed fruit set, that's because inadequate pollination. Uh, stocky open plants, low on the spines, seem to be less virus and powdery mildew than, than some of the competitors in the hybrids, was definitely more variable than F1s, but was pretty darn stable. Uh, so for four years then, Bill has just been maintaining this via mass selection. Um, he, do, he alternates between stock seed and production years where he produces stock seed up in Northern Cal and, uh, and, and then the next year he'll do his actual stock seed and do uh, heavy duty uh, selection uh, because now he has quite a bit of demand for seed of this thing. Uh, the Baja, the acreage had gotten up to with one grower down there, grows certified organic, sells into Whole Foods and all of the organic uh, zucchini markets in North America, especially the West Coast in winter. He had 50 acres of this a year ago, and I'm at my five minutes, and it's just going to be perfect here, folks. He had 50 acres a year ago right now. Uh, I, actually, it was late January. Uh, there was a 60-year frost event in Baja and Sinaloa, Mexico, which is a large two of the uh, states of Mexico where they do a large amount of the winter vegetable production for the U.S. 
there was a frost. It was probably, we didn't get good, accurate readings, probably about 31, probably like 31 degrees, 30.5. All of the heritage from Harris Moray and the hybrid, which was most of the growers' production, was in heritage. All of the heritage and uh, all of the, any other competitive uh, zu hybrid uh, zucchini anywhere in those two states of Mexico was completely fried with the frost. It lasted a few hours one night. Uh, amazingly, the next morning, uh, Dark Star was standing. We don't know how the hell we got uh, frost resistance. Sometimes you get lucky as plant breeders. But we at least, it survived a, a degree or two Fahrenheit uh, colder than normal. So for about four weeks last February, we were very proud because our Dark Star was the only, you could go to a, uh, it was the only zook, organic zook available in north, in, uh, north of the border. You could go in a Whole Foods in Toronto and the zooks were Dark Star, which I, as I told Bill, I said, that well, we probably had, that was the most uh, hybrid, uh, that was the most open pollinated zucchini that have been packed in North America probably in 60 years. So um, with that, I will end. Uh, by the way, the grower is now up to about something crazy. Bill said in an email, I think 400 acres now this year. He's gone whole hog for it. Uh, so very successful on-farm breeding, minimal hand pollination, minimal record keeping. It can be done. Okay, I'll entertain questions. We have definitely at least 10 minutes for questions, right? 20, good. Should I take one from the audience first? Give them priority right over there. Uh, so the question is, could Bill have gotten to that point of having such a good variety without that initial raven cross? My answer would be no. He wouldn't have had the... Uh, in that amount of time, selecting for o that open habit was, A, number one, the open habit was really important from the raven. Um, the, I think to get something as nice a fruit shape, it would have taken, even with uh, recurrent progeny selection, it would have taken at least three cycles of that to get as nice a fruit type too, because that raven just has such a beautiful fruit type. It was locked in. Yes, next question from the uh, ethers. Next question is coming in from Simon Neufeld. Um, if you could repeat it for the online I will, audience. yes. Um, do you worry about throwing away good genetics when you're cutting back to 15 to 20 percent in one season? My understanding is that conventional breeders will grow thousands of rows and then keep at least 30 percent because they are worried about losing good lines that just look bad by food. That's a great question. So now to repeat it. Uh, do you worry about cutting back to 15 or 20 percent uh, at the at that point in the initially in the I guess that would be in that progeny selection when you're going to rows uh, because normally when uh, large commercial breeders are breeding they often have how many did he say how many uh, not into the well oftentimes and we have Bill Tracy who runs a big nursery uh, certainly thousands of lines, Bill, right, in any one season, inbred lines. And then would you say, this person said, and they often will keep 30% of those? I don't think Bill keeps that many. Right, if it's good, it's good, it's not. So in that way, uh, the caller is asking, in that way, your chances of keeping good Genetics, if in fact that's true, as, as stated, would be higher. This is a case where I would say in, in a cross-pollinated species, if you really know your germplasm, you've really chosen two good parents, you make that initial strain cross where you're keeping a higher percentage uh, of uh, some variability. So you, you basically, all your parents are heterozygous, are, are mixed, right from the get-go. You are, we did narrow it down to essentially four plants is as low as we went. Now normally uh, in conventional breeding, they narrow it to a single plant 
and then, in, especially in a cross-pollinated species, in regular pedigree breeding, you self-individual plants, and you go to progeny rows, and then self again, and do that repeatedly for three or four generations. That, to me, seems to be even within any one uh, line, you're narrowing much more than we did going to four plants that contributed to the eventual population. Now, as far as the scope of the whole, uh, all the genetics possible out of those two parental types, uh, certainly we did lose some genetic variability, but again, as one of my mentors, Larry Satterley, used to say, you know, uh, it's as it's as good as it it's as good as what you get essentially. You know, if we got something that was as good as that and proved to be good, and this is where the testing in the field, our benefit of taking this to a really tough climate in Baja and seeing what its metal was really made of, uh, I think really tells the story of we kept pretty darn good genetics. Now, whether we had all of the possibilities that would have been possible out of those two parents, the answer to that is. He's right on that fact. Absolutely not. Yes, sir. Joel. After that one cycle, uh, okay, so the question is from Joel. Wait, did you finish? I'm sorry. Excellent question. So in this case, uh, specifically with the dark star zucchini, we had the really only one cycle of those three years of the progeny selection. And in recurrent selection, often a cycle will take three, three seasons. Um, and then we went to mass selection. So this, Joel's question is, if you're going from progeny, if you've done a progeny selection, and uh, when do you decide it's good enough to then just go to maintaining it with mass selection, right? So uh, in this case, this was a split decision, actually. Uh, the, after the first cycle of progeny selection, I still didn't think, and to this day don't think it's done, and dying to do another round of progeny selection. I'd like to true it up a little bit more. But this is a perfect example where the farmer who knew his crop, I mean, nobody's more of a zucchini nerd than Bill and really knows his crop. And it takes it very seriously on, on how much pack out am I getting as a commercial farmer. He said, you know what, this is ready for prime time. It's good enough for me now. If we have enough funding to go on and do another progeny selection, by the way, this funding for that initial progeny uh, work was, was done through, through Seeds of Change. Um, so he said, you know what, I need, this seed is better than anything I got, so I'm going to use it at this point. So actually the second part of the answer is, you can then say, and this is what Nash has essentially done with his kale, it's like, it's good enough, I'm going to use it as it is. If you want to do a cycle of the progeny, go for it, we'd love to make it even better. Did that answer the question, does everybody think? for everyone here. Okay, another online question. We have an uh, online attendee in uh, British Columbia, and they're wondering about uh, doing progeny selection on a small acreage, and wondering if you could suggest uh, crops that require minimal physical space to do a progeny selection. Excellent question. So the, the question from BC is, um, if you have minimal space, uh, limited in your space, what would be a crop that you could do a breeding strategy like this on? And I just happen to have the perfect answer because I've done it with uh, a couple of classes of mine. Um, uh, I think cilantro is, if you really want to go mini, cilantro is the perfect one to do progeny selection. There's lots of good characteristics that are missing in many commercial cilantro uh, varieties. And it's a perfect one to do on a very small scale. We did it at Prescott College on, essentially, we did a whole progeny 
selection breeding method on one three foot wide bed that was about 20 feet long and it w worked great and we made great progress so think of that's a nice specific one but think of anything that's small you could do it with uh, certainly with something like arugula I would say any of the herbs you could do it with something like parsley a little more involved as a as a biennial um, and so in large part, you have to cater it to your, uh, your climate and your system. BC, pretty short season. But uh, certainly the, the small leafy green uh, and or herb plants would be perfect on a real small scale. Any other questions from our audience right here? Wow, no more questions here. Okay. Um, Yes. Yes. Okay. Great question. So um, the question is uh, in Nash's kale breeding project, Nash's red. He started with two red vates plants and then crossed them to Brussels sprouts. And the reason I and the que the question then continues. Um, how does that uh, potentially small amount, as I'm advocating, large uh, strain crosses, how does what seems like maybe a very small uh, number of plants, how does that, what are the ramifications in the eventual breeding? Is that accurate? Um, so the, uh, the reason I always fudge on the Brussels sprouts, how many Brussels sprouts is because Nash will never give me a straight answer. So. <laughs> I haven't gotten it out of him, and I, I don't know if he's like, doesn't want to admit that he doesn't remember, <laughs> or if it's just foggy. But I would imagine, from my experience, my years with Nash at this point, he probably dug up three or four uh, Brussels sprouts plants. And they were, in fact, hybrid Brussels sprouts. Uh, he said, that's for certain. I quizzed him on this the other day, actually, before this talk. One more time trying to get that number out of him. Um, but uh, so, the, the reason he only used the two red kale is because that's what he had. And yeah, the first thing that I think we need to remember is, remember there have been many good varieties that have come out of one single plant crossed to one single plant. Uh, when I emphasize the making the strain cross, the old alfalfa breeding trick of the strain cross, it's just because I'm a little obsessive with this, trying to get as much genetic variability in from the get-go as possible. Uh, now, the second part of the answer is the, di the genetic difference between kale and Brussels sprouts is, even though they're the same species, everybody knows they're part of the Bresca oleraceae, whatever they call it, tribe or whatever, you know, broccoli, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, uh, kohlrabi, all will cross, cauliflower. Uh, but they've been, kale and Br Brussels sprouts have been divergent for so long, for uh, who knows how many hundreds of thousand, maybe up to a couple thousand years, that um, uh, the genetics are really very different. So he got a lot of what we'd think in plant breeding, uh, heterotic boost out of that, hybrid vigor out of that. You're putting together a bunch of genes that hadn't been together in a long time. So I think out of that generally, and we're going to have Bill is putting up his hand, but out of that generally, you're going to really benefit from divergent genetics. Bill, comment. You, you said that the Brussels sprouts variety was that one. Yes. Thank you, Professor Tracy. Very good. Yes. It, it, Bill's comment there, Bill Tracy from University of Wisconsin, was the Brussels sprouts was an F1. It doesn't matter. They were essentially genetically identical at that point. So you could have used one Brussels sprout plant and gotten the same bang for your buck. Thanks, Bill. Yes. Yeah. So okay. Very excellent question. And. So the question is, uh, how do you make sure that 
those plants that you're flowering, in the case of Brascola racia, such a common crop as uh, kale, uh, broccoli, cabbage, all those things that could be flowering, how do you make sure you can keep those pure and not crossed with something else? And that's especially true in western Washington where we have a hell of a lot of those crops everywhere. Uh, Nash has the benefit of, A, number one, having rather large acreage that he farms on, 400 plus acres that he rotates on. You really only need with uh, some physical obstruction about a half a mile to keep most of the crossing down. Uh, a mile is nice. And when he made the initial cross between the kale and the, um, the Brussels sprouts, he, he did it in his backyard, which is his little isolated spot on one of the eskers, and if you know what an esker is, it's where all of the, the uh, rocks were dumped from the last ice age. He has this nice garden in a house that's miles from any other broccoli or whatever. So he can always make his initial crosses there, and then when he gets out in the field, he just places it aptly within his huge farm. And most of his neighbors are not growing brassicas, though squim is a cauliflower seed production area. Commercially. Does that answer your question? You got to know your environs. You got to go out, you got to keep every time you get in the car, every time you hopefully even bike or walk or whatever, you just keep your eyes out and say you kind of know what everybody's doing. All the farmers who work with cross-pollinated species tend to become really familiar with who's growing what. And we've had cases like with zucchini, we were growing a pumpkin seed crop once in Montana and there was a older woman who had a zucchini patch and we went to her and we said you know what would you mind pulling up your zucchini plants we will deliver to you three times a week a little basket of zucchinis all season long because we've got a pumpkin seed crop so yes sir Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, um, when you take, uh, make a cross between a leafy brassica and a heading brassica, those little uh, Brussels sprouts heads, why, how are you going to get, how are you assured of getting something leafy versus heady? Uh, in this case, um, the ancestral form with our prior knowledge, and I don't know if Nash went in with this information, but uh, <laughs> Leafy is pretty darn dominant, and you can, it's the ancestral form, and that plant would much rather be leafy than, than head. But even if Nash hadn't known that, uh, so that makes your life easier, A, number one. Number two, you're going to get segregation between the two, and almost always you can select, even if one is more dominant to the other. It may take longer, but you're going to get the, the range of traits in progeny. Uh, I guess that's the two answers. Yes, an online uh, question, then we'll get back. Can you recommend any online tracking system for keeping the genome record using the recommended parking collection methodology? Wow, great question. So can I recommend any online tracking system, so some sort of online pedigree uh, program, I suppose, uh, for keeping track of uh, the progeny in a, in, a, in a breeding project like the ones I've described. Uh, that's the question. I would say, um, I, don't, I don't know, do we, is there anything like that? I would ask the plant breeders in the room. There are, there are. And I think generally, that's not a program. That's a good answer. So Bill, uh, Bill comments, uh, yes, they are, there are some pedigree plant breeding uh, programs, they cost probably significant money, right? Um, thousands of dollars. Uh, using just a good old Excel uh, uh, spreadsheet, many breeders uh, live and die by their Excel spreadsheet, right? Excellent. So 
Jared speaking on behalf of Organic Seed Alliance says, once we have our introductory plant breeding um, manuals that were in the works that he specifically is working on with us, uh, there will be some type of form that will be available to show you how it's done, and then you can abridge it for yourself. Okay, do we have time for one more? Do we go to the half hour? Okay, yeah. Was that Marco? And there was one in the back, too. But maybe I should go in line. Yes. Okay, so two comments there. One is white peacock. Um, so, so white peacock is a hybrid. A hybrid. Kale? I just can't believe I don't... Oh, okay, so uh, the question is there... Uh, Okay, so the question is, uh, in, in a so-called dehybridization or trying to make a new stable variety out of a hybrid uh, white peacock ornamental kale, um, uh, in, in the breeding process, it cro inadvertently crossed with Brussels sprouts, and now they have white Brussels sprouts. Uh, what do we do? Uh, when you have lemons, you make lemonade. What's wrong with a white Brussels sprout? <laughs> um, I would say just go another generation. It's believe me, that leafiness is gonna it, it's in there. It's gonna come out if it really was a cross. I would keep going. Uh, you can always, if you go down a blind alley and it gets crazy, you can always go back and start over. I hate to say that, but do you? And the other thing that plant breeders often do is they save remnant seed, so it's like, oops, it screwed up, now I'm going to go back to the generation before it screwed up and start. But that, the, the uh, Brussels, Brussels sprouts might give you some good genetic boost there, and it might make it better tasting. Some of those ornamental kales are pretty rasty. Uh, Frank Morton has used ornamental kales in some of his breeding, but it's always in crossing it into pretty good tasting material, because uh, some of the or, you know the ornamental kales ain't that good eating. Oh, and the other comment was, uh, and then uh, many seed companies now have things like Broca flower and all matter of uh, combination of traits between the different Brassica oleracea. Yes, you too can create your own new Frankenstein. <laughs> Any other ones? Uh, oh, good. Yes, okay, so the question is, can I suggest other climatic adaptation characteristics? Uh, and maybe we, collectively there are other people in the audience that have ideas. The ones that I'm always thinking about is, uh, well, I work a lot with cold hardiness, so, and especially in this part of the world, we have, we go to about 14, 15 degrees F or minus 10 C, which seems to be a real cutoff for when the cold hardiest vegetables don't survive. So we often, uh, we love that because it's selection we can do in the field without a lot of work. Um, heat tolerance, many people are getting more interested in. Drought tolerance, I mentioned those. Um, environmentally, anybody else got any to mention to our online audience? that they think about? Heat, cold, pardon me? Flood tolerance. Certainly, uh, certainly ability of, of root systems to withstand cold, wet conditions is, is a biggie. So flood tolerance is a good suggestion. And uh, oftentimes if you're selecting for just good, vigorous growth, uh, especially in the seedling stage, you're selecting for plant roots that will 
withstand that and can grow out of that. But, but specifically, planting repeatedly with something that you found through trials is a little bit tougher than your average bear into cold, wet soils and doing it for not maybe not just for springtime but for main season, uh, you will find, uh, if you're at all lucky, you'll find segregants that are better than average and you can you could breed for something like that. So that's a great suggestion. I'm running out of time. I probably have one minute officially. Any last? Yes. Um, the question is a practical one of once you harvest the zucchini, the big fully grown baseball bat zucchinis, uh, how long do you let them sit before you extract the seed, before you cut them open to get the seeds out? We have some folks from Seed Savers Exchange. What is the, I'll go to you guys for the, I'd say at least three or four weeks if you can pull it off. Okay, that's a great answer, and I'll repeat it as our last comment here. So the answer from Shannon at Seed Savers is um, uh, <coughs> zucchini do not uh, store that well, uh, ripe zucchini, fully mature zucchini. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, so her point is an excellent one, which is just let them mature, stay on the plant as long as possible. You get a lot of good what I've always called after maturing by just leaving them on the plant. So that's excellent. And then if you can cut them, if you have a place to keep them, keep them for, you know, often you're busy, keep them for a week or two if you can. Seems to always be some advantage in the cucurbitaceae once you've harvested the fruit to let some more after maturing happen off the plant. But her point is an excellent one, which is watch them closely and extract the seed before you get any serious rot, because you can lose seed then if you let them sit and turn into a puddle of mush. Yeah, that's pretty cold. Yeah, and, and so the, the couple of comments there are um, they're, keeping, they're keeping, in Alberta, a very cold climate where it's not many good places to store. They're bringing them in at room temperature, essentially, into the house, and, but cool. And again, the optimum is cool, dry, 50 to 55, 10 to 14 C, and uh, uh, if they store for a couple of months, as long as they don't sprout, they're fine. Okay, that's it. We're out of time. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>